gospel text for this Sunday is taken from Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. <clears throat> John said to the crowds, coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ox is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, the man with two tunics should share, should share rather with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money. Now don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly, were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water. But one more powerful that I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated, <laughs> Simon says. Friends in Christ, grace and peace be to you from our Father, um, from the Spirit that continues to not only work miracles, but surprise us at every corner, it seems like, with his goodness and um, his creative love for each and every one of us. Let's pray, shall we, and, 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 and go into the, to the word this morning. Thank you, Father, for your good news. And as much as we may not understand it, at least not in its entirely, you and your faithfulness are making it known, revealing it to us in the perfect way that we can begin to understand and to grow in our knowledge of you. And in so doing, be set free. Be set free. Free to worship you in spirit and in truth. And this we pray in your great name. Speak to us again this morning, Father, so that we may reflect and embody your nature. For it is possible. You've made it possible. And because of that, we worship you. And thank you and give, give praise to you. In your great name, amen. So, uh, there's a lot to be said. This is a continuation of what we were talking about last week with John the Baptist. And in honor of John the Baptist, this is the second Sunday that I wore my coat of camel's hair and a leather belt. Although I don't think that's what they quite had in mind when they were describing him. Um, but John, John the Baptist, uh, there's a few things that always stand out with John the Baptist besides what he wore. Uh, one was his message and one was his, his teaching regarding that message. And so I want to get into that because he came baptizing and if you grew up in church, how many people, by the way, just show of hands, grew up in church? Anybody not grow up in church? Okay. Baptism can be a little weird. Like, what are you doing? Not if you grow up in, in it, you know? If I, if I invite a number of people over and decide I want to make lutefisk, it's, it's going to be weird for you all. 
It's like, I don't like the smell. What is this? But for me, I grew up with it, so it's like home. Okay? Just familiar with it. And if you grow up in church, baptism is familiar. It's not something that's foreign. But when John showed up on the scene, it was very foreign. Everything was completely changed. Everything that they un thought they understood about God was now changed. And one of the things that we read about is that they were coming to John to be baptized. Before that, Jews never went to John to be baptized. They didn't go to anybody to be baptized. That's not what Jews did. As a sign of their relationship with God, they were circumcised. But you're not going to have a circumcised Lent wreath up here, or, or, or Advent wreath. That ain't going to happen. Because it's baptism now. But see, that it, it, it went from an external way of relating with God, something that we could do on our own, something that we don't need God to do. We could literally do it ourselves. That's what Paul means by the flesh. To something that we can't do by ourselves, which is baptism. Now, you can still perform the ritual baptism without God. I don't need God to fill up the thing with water. I don't need God to say the right words. But I do need God for what baptism represents, the spiritual truth that it represents, which is to be immersed in the reality of a world permeated with God. To be immersed in that reality. To enter that reality. That's why in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, unless you're baptized with the Spirit, you can't, enter, you can't be born. Sometimes we translate that born again. Better translation is born from above, but whether it's born again or born from above, you're still born. And if you're born, it means you enter a reality. If a person is still born, they never had that opportunity to enter a reality. And so John is proclaiming the kingdom. It is a reality that, that, that permeates everything. We may not be aware of it. In fact, because of sin, we're not aware of it. But that doesn't mean that that reality is still not just as real, if not more real, than what we can perceive. And so to enter that reality, the kingdom, the, what we can do is surrender ourselves to this Reality to be immersed in this reality. That's what baptism is. And therefore, you don't have to go to the priest any longer to confess your sins with the prescribed animal and or mm, vegetarian, or vegetarian, see, you can see where my mind is, um, produce, if you will, that needs to be given as a sacrifice, whether it's wheat or, or anything of that nature, fruit. That, that system is done. And there's a new way, a new way of relating with God. And it's so radical. But it hinges on, it hinges on repentance. Without repentance, without understanding what repentance is, first of all, you can't, you can't engage with it. And if you can't engage with repentance, then all of Christianity simply becomes various rituals, observances, and it can be taken over by the flesh. I mean, we don't really need God to light the candles. We can do it on our own. And we don't need God to play the hymns. We can do that on our own. In fact, churches can go and do pretty much everything that they do on some level without God at all. And that's what we call living our lives collectively by the flesh. People right now can live their entire life without God. It's horrible, by the way, but you can do it, and it's very tormenting, but people can do it. They do it all the time. Anything that we can do outside of God and do outside of God is what Paul refers to as the flesh. And the flesh has very little value. In fact, it will eventually just be burned up like everything else. Now, <clears throat> this change, this repentance, in fact, go back to verse 3, he went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance until we get to verse 7. And repentance Talk about change. Well, what is it? Change, change from what to what is a good way to, to, to look at that. If you're going to change, you're going to change 
from something to something. And it's a change that is demonstrated in Christ himself, who was um, what we would call in integrity. Now, there's a lot to be said, and the way we have things structured in, in church is the, the I, I continue to say this, it's the worst way that you would ever want to teach any subject matter whatsoever. You got 20 minutes if you're Baptist, 40 minutes, but that's tops. Once a week, you can't learn anything that way. Um, but nonetheless, we'll give it a little shot. You get, a, you get a glimpse of it when the crowds come to be baptized by him, and he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance is a lifelong process of, of what we would call discipleship. It's change. And that is what we are to be engaged in. If we're not engaged in repentance, then nothing's going to make sense in terms of what we do in Christian life. In fact, every, most of what we do in Christian life, we don't need to do at all. And we would be, we would be just fine without it. But repentance, that's, that's the one we need to be doing. Because that's the one that not only John comes proclaiming and teaching, but also Jesus himself. And this is what discipleship entails, a repentance, a change. However, I'm going to guess if you ask most Christians, what does it mean to repent? They probably will have some kind of an idea like, well, you should really feel sorry for your sins. Have you ever felt that? Ever been taught that? If you haven't been taught that, do, do, do. let me just take a look at our hymnal here. Um, is this mine or is this yours? That's yours. Mine, I did, what did I do with mine? Oh, here it is. Remember when we went to page 94 because we wanted to confess our sins because we're kind of, re some ways, doing what John the Baptist did? <clears throat> what we did not do is the confession that's on the right hand part of the page. Gracious God, have mercy on us. Can we confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. Are you? Are you? I mean, you got to think about that. Are you really sorry? Are you, well, the sorry can be a feeling. It can also be an awakening that causes a feeling. But, ca but feeling sorry is not repentance. Feelings are part of what repentance uh, changes but they are not in and of themselves repentance. And much of religious life has been focused on, because of the lack of understanding of repentance, feelings. You come to church and you better play something that makes me feel something or I'm not coming back. Right? <laughs> oh, that was really inspiration. You really made me feel something. Or, oh, that person was so boring. I, didn't, I wasn't inspired at all. And when, when religion is centered around feelings, it will lead to very shallow, superficial, mean Christians that have no difference in their way of life than anybody else who's not a Christian. Because most of the world, the rest of the world, is led by, conditioned by, feelings. Well, gee, pastor, if it's not feelings, what is it? Lighting candles can give us a feeling, but that's not why we do them. We do them because they are symbolic of a greater reality, not because they make us feel good. Nothing wrong with feeling good, but that's not why we do it. That's prob that probably threw a monkey wrench into you. Did that throw a monkey wrench into anyone's mind right now? Okay, good. Because generally, wow. Oh, should I, go, should I go to church today? I don't know if I'm in the mood. We mainly do things if we're in the mood. What does that mean? It means if we feel like it. We have no idea that church itself, gathering, is a discipline. 
that is not required about faith. You don't go to a basketball team and say, hey, we got a big game coming up on Friday. Who's in the mood to practice? <laughs> well, gee, I'm just not in the mood. Okay, we don't have to practice. And then you go to the game and you get wiped out 100 to 3. I don't understand why we just can't get any better. Because we don't practice. Why don't you practice? Because we're not in the mood. Oh, okay. Well, that makes me feel sad. Yeah, I know. It's all feelings. There's nothing wrong with feelings. But they're horrible taskmasters. <clears throat> so, repentance is change. And one of the things that when we take a look at this, most merciful God, we confess that we're captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done, by what we have left done. We haven't loved you with our whole heart. We have uh, This gets old. Well, this is a reality if the mindset is, therefore, we're just stuck. We're just going to say, say the same thing over and over. You better be getting to a place where you love God more and more. Otherwise, what, what, what the heck are we doing? Well, it makes me feel good to say the confession. It ain't about feelings. At some point in time, we have to ask ourselves, in Christian life, is it ever possible to be freed from the bondage of sin? Is it? You know, and I should just stop right there and let you think about that. That would be enough but I can't. That's woe is me Christianity. At best, I can walk around saying, oh, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, and when I die, hopefully have the right doctrine so I get to get into heaven. That's not repentance. <clears throat> Is it possible that we are no longer in bondage to sin? That's a big question. And it makes a huge difference as to how one lives their life. Well, using Jesus' words, to the Jews who had trusted in him, believed in him, he said, if you continue in my teaching, if you continue, not stop, but continue. Then you're truly my disciples. And you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Christian life is a life in which we are able to be free from the bondage of sin. We don't have to be stuck with it. If we are stuck with it, you just get poor people that wring their hands. Oh. But if we're not, you get people that begin to walk, as Paul says, in the power, the full power of God, which sets us free from the law of sin and death. That's a, a lot to think about. It's the last two things. Feelings, sin, the whole thing. It, it, it's, it's pretty big. Ultimately, what changes, repentance, the core issue is the change that takes place in the deepest part of human life, of human existence, of yourself, the deepest part of who you are, the deepest part of who I am, the core part of who we are, which is our will, not our feelings. Our feelings can influence our will and move our will. Oh, I'm, I'm going to lose weight. And your feelings would be like, oh, how about tomorrow? Ever have that talk with yourself? 
See, this is what's talking, this is what, this is the human condition. We are duplicitous. We, I, well, should I, uh, and you see this, I don't know what to do, this, well, uh, we, we don't know how to, we, we're just ang filled with anxiety because we're duplicitous. Well, what I want to do, I can't do, and what I can't, oh, Paul knew about that. How about the doctor says, you know what you're going to need to do? You're going to need to lose weight. <sighs> Exercise. You ever heard of that one? <sighs> now I have to fight my body. My will, now Jesus understood this, the spirit, the will, is willing. But the flesh, it's not just weak. It fights against your will. As we see in the case of Peter, I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to deny you at all. And Jesus, understanding what was in his heart, in his will, said, yeah, you will, because your will is not yet shaped. Your will has been shaped and forged, and the character of your will, not the will itself, the character of your will, the nature of your will is such that you will be dominated by fear and do things that you'd never thought you would ever do. You will deny me three times. And he was just, no, I will not. No, I will not. You ever have that? You, you, you're so confident of the determination that you have. I will not do that. And then you find yourself doing it. You go, I'm a loser. Because that's what happens when the will has been hijacked by forces other than what you want the will to do. You feel like a loser. You feel like you're in bondage. And we are in bondage. Our will is in bondage to an idea an idea that was implanted in humanity in Genesis 3. God is not good. God does not have the good planned for you. And you cannot trust God. Therefore, for you to be happy, for you to fulfill your God-ordained destiny as a spiritual being, Genesis 1.26, you must take matters into your own hands. And that's the idea that has corrupted the will. Because it's not just an idea that stays in the mind. It's an idea that permeates the feelings, your feeling life. It's an idea that eventually makes its way into the body so that the body is posed to take matters into your own hands. Here's a, great, here's a little example of it. Y'all know, or you come to know, that I have a fancy for coffee. I don't fancy much in my life much anymore, but coffee is one of them that I do. I like it hot. I don't like anything in it, and I like it with a good taste. And I like it first thing in the morning. I look forward to it. What does that mean? In anticipation, I want to experience the pleasure it gives me. I want it. And I'm willing to pay for it. Not too much, but I'll pay for it. Much more than my parents ever taught me to pay for coffee. <laughs> but I can justify it because, <clears throat> and this is where self-righteousness comes in, I can justify it because <clears throat> I have a better palate. See how the, how the mind justifies what the will wants? So I go there today. Seldom do I go on a Sunday morning because it's pretty early. And I go to this new coffee place that I wanted to go to that I know I really like their coffee. And I arrive there at 6.35 on my way to church. Oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to have good hot coffee, be in the Word, pray. And I go in. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, sir. We don't open till 7. Now, what happens normally when you don't get what you want? Tell me. You've been on the planet longer than I have, I think. <laughs> you just say, oh, okay, <laughs> sirrah, sirrah. And you just leave the coffee shop? No. The first thing, and it, you don't choose it, it arises from the members of your body. You get angry. 
oh, it might be a little, no, not me, pastor. I'm a good Christian. I don't get angry, but I do get irritated. Uh-huh. Good for you. That's the mind <laughs> trying to convince himself of its own righteousness. And the anger that you get is, you just feel it. What happens if it, well, just, if it builds enough, I just... You ever have people do that? That's what happens when you get angry. You have to do something physical because it is physical. And then if that doesn't work, you'll go to the person behind the counter. You know what? I'm sick and tired. Uh, and you'll know, you just blast them with your anger. And then, of course, they have to take it because they're an employee. And this is the way the world works. Based an on an idea, an idea that I deserve to get whatever I want. Whatever I want. When I want it. How I want it. And if I don't get it, I have a right, a God-given righteous right to be angry. And if I have a right to be angry, I also have a right to be mean. Because I'm, this is where the world is. And it all boils down to an idea that I can't trust in God. That this scenario that has taken place, I must control. That I am required to, f to meet all of my needs. That there is no God in this scenario. And this is the idea that permeates not just my mind, but my subconscious, my feelings, my body, everything. Repentance is the complete metamorphosis, if you will, of my entire being to be like Christ. So that I don't react from that idea. I react from the reality that, oh, okay, well, God's created this to happen. Or God has allowed me to experience this for whatever reason. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about my happiness. Something will happen. But you see, what happens in so many instances is that our mind, our body, our way has been conditioned habitually to react from sin, sin, the idea that has now infiltrated my body, that it runs on its own momentum. That's why it is very difficult to change. You ever go to the doctor and, they, you know, oh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, but you just can't eat this anymore. Who, who gives you the right to tell me I can't eat? The, it, very difficult to change habits. Very difficult to change habits. And sin, at its core, is habitual. Once the devil has implanted that, and you repeat that idea, and you begin to act upon that idea, and you begin to form your feelings around that idea and your body reactions around that idea, it becomes so habitual that you don't even know anything but sin. And that's why when they get to John and they says, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do to do this repentance? Starting with verse 7 and going down, you brood of vipers produce fruit. What is fruit? We've heard it in church. You've heard, you know, fruit. Fruit is basically the manifestation of the nature of whatever plant or living being that is producing the fruit carries. That's why an apple tree will not produce lemons, the wrong fruit. That's why Jesus is the vine where the branches we produce fruit, which is basically his nature. So when we produce fruit, we're basically manifesting his goodness. But
But if you're so separate from God, you don't even know what his goodness is, you're lost. And this is the state of the world without God. We don't even know what's good anymore. What's good now is determined by a majority consensus. It's called in the political realm, political correctness. Whatever is deemed politically correct or good, that is now enforced as good. Jesus says, when, when, when approached by an individual regarding his teaching, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And before Jesus answers the question, remember his response? Why you call me good? Let's just make one thing clear, because you're looking at me as a human being. So let's make one thing clear. Only God is good. And any good that comes from humanity at all is simply an outpouring of God's nature that God placed within us or is dwelling within us that you're seeing. It doesn't originate with us. This Christmas, when we're celebrating the birth of God, if you pay attention, you will be acutely aware that the whole celebration, the spiritual observance, if you will, has been hijacked by idolatry. We worship feelings more than the risen Christ. Here's another idolatry, family. We worship family <clears throat> more than God. We can experience all of our happiness if we just have the right family. <coughs> Excuse me. That too can become idolatrous. They do with my water. Here we are. If we don't feel a certain way, have a certain mindset, do certain things that we're supposed to be doing in order because they're supposed to be done, we can feel a certain way and it hijacks the entire reality that God came into the world hidden and revealed himself, the creator of the universe, by taking on flesh and living among us and revealing to us his plan of his kingdom. That's it. Everything else is idolatry. And so, my friends in Christ, as we go toward this observance, my prayer, first of all, on a selfish uh, standpoint, is that I don't get caught up in it, in the idolatry part of it. I probably will, but I don't want to. And my prayer that God's people also do not get caught up in the idolatry part, but that in keeping with repentance, we keep Christ and the reality of repentance in him as the front and center of our focus, our desire, and our will. And I'm open all week if you have any questions. I figure... There are no questions, so hopefully you're picking it all up. But I've been in church long enough to go. You know, one more time the Vikings play. This is par for the course, you know. Ten o'clock, by the way. Let's pray.